I first discovered my interest in video games back in 1976 when, as a young boy of the age of seven, I put my hands to a Telstar Pong system that had been given to me by my father. As I grew up, I continued developing that interest, investing some of the quarters I earned as a paperboy to visit the local 7-Eleven or the arcade to try out games like Space Invaders. From there, I taught myself basic programming, first on Apple IIs, then on Atari 800 computers. Eventually, after graduating from college, I began my career as a professional game developer in 1995. That fascination with video games has continued to this day. But, although I have considered myself something of a gamer now for over four decades, it wasn't until fairly recently that I've discovered that some media critics genuinely believe that video games don't qualify as a legitimate art form. Famous film critic Roger Ebert typified this position. And even though Roger Ebert has since passed away, that won't stop me from arguing that not only is Ebert wrong in his exclusion of video games from art, but that video games actually represent the pinnacle of artistic achievement for humanity. They are what the other art forms of history have aspired to be. It is only now, with the rise of sufficient technology, that we are approaching levels of artistic expression that past artists could only have dreamed of. Be it the sculpture and painting of Michelangelo, or the music of Beethoven, the plays and sonnets of Shakespeare, or the films of Spielberg, the past artists of history will one day be regarded as quaint steps towards the emerging ultimate art form that we currently call video games. Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes. Morons. In Roger Ebert's original blog post, he says, I remain convinced that, in principle, video games cannot be art. He then goes on to explain that, an obvious difference between art and games is that you can win a game. It has rules, points, objectives, and an outcome. And furthermore that, an immersive game without points or rules ceases to be a game and becomes a representation of a story, a novel, a play, a dance, or a film. Those are things that you cannot win, you can only experience them. Any gamer worth his or her glowy bits recognizes that this definition, that a game must be built to serve only the notion of winning, rather than upon providing immersion in an experience, is an especially shallow and self-serving one. It's a straw man representation that speaks more to Ebert's ignorance of the subject matter than to an informed investigation. However, to Ebert's credit, he recognized his lack of knowledge about gaming in a follow-up blog post that was called, OK Kids, Play on My Lawn. Here he states in bold type, I should not have written that entry without being more familiar with the actual experience of video games. But then he goes on to double down on his position by recounting a conversation he had with filmmaker Clive Barker on the subject, in which Clive Barker had said, I think that Roger Ebert's problem is that he thinks that you can't have art if there is malleability in the narrative. And Ebert responds in his blog with, Well, yes, that is what I think. Their conversation continued, Barker, let's invent a world where the player gets to go through every emotional journey available. That is art. Offering that to people is art. Ebert, if you can go through every emotional journey available, doesn't that devalue each and every one of them? Art seeks to lead you to an inevitable conclusion, not a smorgasbord of choices. If next time I have Romeo and Juliet go through the story naked and standing on their hands, would that be way cool or what? Later on in the blog, Ebert acknowledges that his original proclamation that video games can't be art in principle came more from an emotional reaction to the idea than from thinking deeply about what constitutes art. After that, he stumbles about for a while looking for a definition of art that will allow him to exclude video games while still including everything else that he personally wants to include. He eventually gives up and says, I concluded without a definition that satisfied me. I was a fool 
for mentioning video games in the first place. Now, with all due respect to the late Mr. Ebert, I think I can at once both put my finger on the aspect of video games that is so troubling to him and then argue that it is this same aspect that makes video games the ultimate art form. And that key element is activity. Or in other words, games universally require some kind of input from their audience before they can be fully realized. They are influenced by and react to the participation of their players. Other forms of art do not. Video games are active. Other art forms are passive. Based on Ebert's objection to the ability for participants in video games to potentially alter the outcome of a narrative, this requirement is precisely what rubs him, and presumably other critics of video games as art, the wrong way. For these critics, the participatory nature of video games can only do violence to the beauty or the emotional power of a work of art. For them, introducing an element of choice in the flow or direction of a narrative is more likely to undercut its force than to enhance it. Works of art are something to be admired, appreciated, and reflected upon, but never to be directly interacted with. There is something sacred in being a passive consumer, suggesting that a participant might take action and influence a work of art is unimaginable almost to the point of heresy. Ebert reveals this bias for passivity in his imagined retelling of Romeo and Juliet as a burlesque comedy. Similar critics may ask, how can anyone expect that they'd improve upon Da Vinci's Mona Lisa by flogging it with a paintbrush? Or how could chiseling away at Michelangelo's David make it any more compelling? Where's the value in rewriting Joyce's Ulysses to feature Bozo the Clown, or in reshooting Citizen Kane to end in a pie fight? So don't gamers see how ridiculous it is to think that they could improve upon these great works of art by getting involved with them? Anything you did would almost certainly ruin them. The problem, of course, is that critics such as Ebert are approaching the active and participatory nature of video games from their habituated reliance upon passive consumption. The artworks used to make their point were never intended to have a participatory component. They were all created to be passively experienced and admired without any kind of influence from those who experienced them. In order to correctly evaluate the artistic value of video games, one has to shift their thinking away from being a mere observer where your passive experience is essentially the same as that of everyone else's, to thinking in terms of being an active participant such that your experience is uniquely individuated to you. Rather than viewing the art from the outside, games invite you to experience the art from the inside. All the beauty and emotional power that you might experience secondhand via passive art form becomes something that you experience firsthand as an agent of choice and consequence. The power to influence the direction of a game experience isn't a weakness. Rather, it is what makes each game experience unique to you and hence, potentially, tremendously meaningful. Because we are so used to thinking in terms of art from an external and passive perspective, it is understandably very difficult to rethink of it now in terms of being internal and active. Perhaps the best way I can illustrate the mental shift necessary is by providing a couple of examples. But before I do that, let's first at least agree that there is nothing in a passive form of art, say in film, literature, theater, or painting, that can't also be replicated in a video game simply by removing the active element of choice for a span of time. All the elements found in these other artistic media can also be realized within the service of games. Passive art forms are therefore, in a sense, a subset of the active art form that is gaming. Anything you can be, I can be greater. Sooner or later, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, I am.
Let's start by looking at what is almost certainly the most popular video game of all time. When considered across all platforms, including mobile devices, the puzzle game Tetris has sold nearly 500 million copies. The game is ubiquitous, and nearly everyone who has access to anything considered an interactive device has some familiarity with it. When looked at through the traditional filter of passive art criticism, seeing Tetris as anything approaching something genuinely artistic is a tough sell. All it consists of is rotating colored blocks that drift down from the top of the screen such that they fit into the spaces below. Doing so such that an entire line is filled rewards the player by dissolving that line so that the pieces left above drop down and more space is freed up. And you do this endlessly until you either fail at the task or run out of room for new pieces or you tire of the exercise and simply give up. How in the world can this be anything even approaching art? The trick to seeing the artistic genius of Tetris lies not merely looking at the screen, as we are used to doing for other art forms, but in looking at what it is asking the player to do. Turn the focus around from what's happening externally and instead dive into the mind of the person and the choices that he or she is making to participate in the game. Ask yourself, what is so damned compelling in the game of Tetris that hundreds of millions of people have spent literally hours of their lives rotating blocks and fitting them into gaps just so that they can make more space to keep on doing it again and again and again? What does that say about us as players? Or more pointedly, what does the nearly universal appeal of this activity say about us as humans? The answer we find is surprisingly deep. Our primate brains have evolved over millions of years to be exceptionally good at recognizing patterns in the world around us. Those of our ancestors who were good at finding and utilizing those patterns had better chances for survival. This means that our brain chemistry evolved to naturally reward itself with little squirts of dopamine whenever it succeeds at either recognizing a pattern or at manipulating knowledge of a pattern to accomplish something. Tetris abstracts this aspect of our shared evolutionary psychology and lays it bare. It engages our neurons in such a way that each successful elimination of a line jolts us with a little burst of psychological pleasure. It distills our uniquely human need to translate the chaos of the world in which we find ourselves into order. This endless exercise of extracting order from chaos is what underlies everything we do in our day-to-day -day lives. From the organizing of our closets and sock drawers, to the way we fit our daily tasks into hourly schedules, from the recognition of a narrative in a story, to the way we carve up and catalog the natural world via scientific endeavors. Everything we do reflects our very human need to make sense of the universe. Why, you might even say that we are obsessed with tetricizing the world. Tetris is a mirror of our minds. Tetris is deep art. Again, it's not what's happening up on the screen that reveals this to us. That is only the external representation of the inner experience. The activity and engagement of the players is where the real art happens. Another example. Bioshock was originally released about a decade ago. If you still haven't played it, please be aware that some of what I'm about to say in deconstructing the player's experience will significantly reduce the game's impact upon you. We are entering spoiler territory. Bioshock is a narrative-driven game that is inspired heavily by the writings and philosophy of author Ayn Rand. In brief, the central conceit is that a brilliant business mogul by the name of Andrew Ryan, a clear anagrammed reference to Rand herself, invited the best and brightest of the world to join him in creating a secret underwater capitalist utopia. It would be a world of reason, rationality, and shameless self-interest. 
Andrew Ryan called his underwater city Rapture. His charter was to create a hidden paradise where the greatest minds of humanity could create, discover, and profit without the regulations and burdens normally imposed by the governments or the religions of the world. This idea of rapture closely mirrors Ayn Rand's own fictional utopia called Galt's Gulch, as described in her magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged. Indeed, one of the main characters that the player interacts with in the game Bioshock is named Atlas as an homage. The city of Rapture began as an unparalleled success for its citizens and reached never-before-seen levels of affluence and technology. But about a decade after its inception, Rapture scientists discovered a way to directly splice into a person's genetic code using a stem cell-based biological substance they termed Atom. This substance fueled temporary superpowers, called plasmids, that allowed the citizens of Rapture to perform amazing feats, such as telekinesis, or the ability to summon fire from your fingertips. Seeing the potential for tremendous profits, the businessmen of Rapture immediately began marketing and selling plasmids and Atom. But shortly thereafter, Rapture citizens also discovered that the extended use of Atom created a sort of biological shock to the system that could result in side effects including physical deformities, psychological addiction, and severe mental illness. The once great city of Rapture fell into disarray as the Atom-addicted population turned upon itself. Andrew Ryan attempted to maintain order but without a central governing body, there was no easy way to enforce the peace. Reason and rationality gave way to pure brute force and a sort of civil war broke out between competing factions. The once stable society fell apart. The player enters the game by assuming the role of the protagonist, Jack, after his airplane mysteriously crashes into the ocean near the bathysphere terminus that takes him down to Rapture. At first, Jack believes that his objective is merely to survive and escape the chaos that has engulfed the dying city. But later he learns that his role in the whole affair is much greater. Now, a great deal has been written, and rightly so, about the traditional passive artistic elements that comprise the environment of the game Bioshock. Be that the undersea world, the characters, the art deco architecture, or even the unfolding narrative that drives the story forward. But the real emotional and artistic power comes from the engagement of the player and the experience that he or she has. Early on, the player recognizes that Jack must also infuse himself with plasmids and Adam if he wants to survive. And shortly thereafter, he discovers that Adam is produced by genetically modified female children called Little Sisters. Furthermore, that these little sisters have been conscripted in Rapture's ongoing civil war to extract residual atom from any fallen bodies they discover. They are protected in their work by hulking robotic creations called Big Daddies. What this means to the player is that each little sister he comes across now presents him with a moral dilemma. Does he use his plasmid powers to release her from her servitude? thereby granting her freedom and gaining a small amount of Adam? Or does he harvest her to seize the much larger amount of Adam she contains and thereby also improve his chances of personal survival? This sort of decision is just one example of the many choices that the player is compelled to make as he strives to make his way through Rapture. Which plasmids do you use? Where do you go next? What equipment is best to help you face off against the mad splicers and the big daddies that appear to thwart you at every turn? And so on. Fortunately, you have a friend in the character of Atlas who offers advice via radio transmissions to help see you through things. And Although you face many challenges along the way, things seem to be going quite swimmingly, if you'll pardon the water pun, right up until you come face to face with Andrew Ryan himself. 
and then Bioshock hits you as the player with a twist that simply could not exist in any other passive art medium. The assassin has overcome my final defense, and now he's come to murder me. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money? Power? No. A man chooses. A slave obeys. You think you have memories. A farm. A family. An airplane. A crash. And then this place. Was there really a family? Did that airplane crash? Or was it hijacked? Forced down. Forced down by something less than a man. Something bred to sleepwalk through life until they are activated by a simple phrase spoken by their kindly master. Was a man sent to kill, or a slave? A man chooses. A slave obeys. Come in. Atlas's oft-repeated phrase of, would you kindly, is actually a command phrase that compels you to obey him. And now, Ryan, recognizing that he has been beaten by the treachery of Atlas, commits suicide via your hand to prove the point. Stop, would you kindly? Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Sit. Would you kindly? Stand. Would you kindly? Run. Stop. Turn. A man chooses. A slave obeys. Kill! It reveals that you, as the player in control of Jack, have only experienced the illusion of free will. All those choices you thought you were making in an effort to escape Rapture, turn out not to truly have been choices at all. You were never actually trying to escape Rapture, but rather you have been a puppet unknowingly in the control of Atlas sent on an assassination mission to kill Andrew Ryan. The emotional impact of this disturbing sequence is tremendous, and it is only made that much more so in that the game takes control away from you and renders you powerless. You have no choice in the matter. It turns you from being an active participant into a passive automaton. You become a prisoner who now dances on the strings of powers that you previously did not perceive. And in so doing, the game reaches out from behind the screen to grab you by the brain and make a powerful statement about not only the free will of Jack, but also about that of yours, personally, as an individual. Michelangelo can't do that with his passive art, nor can Da Vinci, Picasso, Spielberg, or even Shakespeare. The individuated and custom emotional experience that arises from a self-recognition of the consequences of your actions is something that belongs uniquely to video games. None of the passive art forms can touch it. In my original draft of this video, I had several other game titles I intended to explore through the lens of active participation versus passive consumption. I thought about digging into how a vast procedurally generated universe simulation, like Elite Dangerous, with its 400 billion star systems, 
can drive home at once both the awe of the numinous while simultaneously filling one with nihilistic and existential angst of recognizing your utter insignificance in the face of such vastness. I consider discussing how a puzzle game like Portal has the potential to transform our notions of three-dimensional space and our relationship to it, while simultaneously challenging us to ask ourselves about the nature of endlessly jumping through hoops just to please unseen masters so we can survive in our modern day world. But I realize that by now, you've probably got my main point. Video games, by their active nature and their focus upon the individual participatory experience, represent a quantum leap forward in the potential for meaningful artistic power. The problem with critics such as Ebert who, in principle, can't see video games as art, comes from an outmoded framework of analysis that holds art as something external to be regarded and admired passively. It is a bias that needs to be abandoned if one wishes to successfully understand the deliberately interactive nature of this new and superior art form. As critics and as players, we need to adopt our analyses of games to focus less on the passive and static elements that have typified art throughout history, and more on the active and participatory elements that are now being realized via modern technology. We need to ask ourselves, what does the player do? And what does that activity mean for each individual experience? Now, don't get me wrong, the old passive art forms are still wonderful and certainly have tremendous value. But given time, I predict that they will largely be subsumed by the new emerging interactive art form that we so quaintly call video games. Literature, sculpture, photography, dance, drawing, and film are the primitive cave paintings of the past. Video games are the future.